Topic video 1A, Introduction to Microprocessors and Microcontrollers. So effectively, what is a microprocessor? Well, the definition defines a microprocessor as a single element having the ability to perform a wide variety of functions. In reality, a microprocessor is nothing more than a series of complex digital circuits able to do many multiple functions in which the action they actually do is defined by some sort of stored instructions. So it's a series of combinatorial logic blocks that are either activated or deactivated depending on the instruction that the processor is doing at that particular point in time. So effectively, a microprocessor is considered to be hardware under the control of software. So a microprocessor consists of numerous hardwired components, functional logic blocks, so a series of little, um, I guess, functional units that are capable of doing a particular task, and then depending on what the software is telling it to do, one of those particular hardware functions will become active or deactive, or they will activate a particular sequence to perform a particular task. So Effectively, a microprocessor is nothing more than a dumb set of logic functions that are simply controlled by a piece of software or a set of software instructions that tell it what to do at what point in time. So when it comes to microprocessors, generally there are two variations that people refer to when they're talking about microprocessors. There are, of course, microprocessors and there are microcontrollers. So how do the two differ? Well, effectively, a microprocessor is nothing more than a, a I guess, a central processing unit that is capable of turning on particular um, logical function blocks depending on what instruction has been given to it. Whereas a microcontroller consists of not only a central processing unit, but some storage capabilities, um, memory in the form of RAM or ROM, as well as some I.O. devices, so some input-output mechanisms as well. So just to reiterate that, a microprocessor is nothing more than a, a central processing unit or a, I guess, a, the intelligence por portion of a, of a processor. And a microcontroller consists of the central processing unit as well as the storage capabilities as well as some input-output devices. So a microcontroller effectively is what we refer to as a single chip solution. So a single quad flat pack or a single IC package in which we not only have the, the brain, but we also have our memory requirements as well as our input, I, input and output requirements as well. So a microcontroller is the easier solution when it comes to doing a, I would guess, a microprocessor enabled design. Whereas if you picked a microprocessor, you'd effectively have to pick a chip for your memory, a chip for your I.O., and then wire all three components together, which can get very difficult. So a microcontroller is a very simple single-chip solution which takes care of all those problems for you. Okay, so micro microcontrollers or microprocessors are effectively smaller versions of a computer. So the history of a computing and microprocessors is very closely linked. It's only when you get to the last, you know, 15 years that they start to split off and go down their own paths. But effectively, the history of computing started around about 350 million years ago, last Tuesday. And this basically is, is seeded in numerical and mathematical concepts. So it was the early development in the in the counting system that sort of paved the way for modern day computing. So as I said in the revision lecture, computers and microprocessors are really heavily reliant on numbers. They see, they look, they smell, they hear, and they talk in numbers. So anything that's good for the numbering system is good for computers and microprocessors. So basically in the era between 1000 BC and 500 BC, we basically had the development of many mechanical machines to support mathematics, devices like the abacus. 
So the very simple, basic um, computational equipment, so to speak, was developed in this era. Abacus made it very easy for people to add and subtract very quickly. So if we move on to the 1500s, to the 1700s, basically during this era, we had Leonardo da Vinci developed a mechanical calculator in 1534 AD. We had John Napier creates the Napier bones, which was multiplication tables, in the 1620 AD. We had William Outridge develops a slide rule in 1621 AD. Well, that was a great invention because a slide rule was still in use 40 years ago. So when you did engineering 40 years ago, you were using the slide rule to do all your calculations, to do your logarithmic conversions and so forth. So slide rule was still used extensively up until about 20 to 30 years ago. And you'll still find some hardcore engineers in industry still using their slide rules. Okay, Blaise Pascal developed the first operating model of a mechanical digital calculator. Okay, that was near the end of the 1700s. It was able to add, subtract, divide and multiply. Okay, in the era between 1800s and the 1900s, we had Joseph Murray Jacquard used punch cards to automate a weaving loom. So he's able to get a weaving loom to do some quite complex patterns based on the pattern on a punch card. So you could sort of think that this was a very early form of a computer program on a punch card, which was effectively telling a mechanical loom how to, I guess, weave a piece of fabric. In 1812, Charles Babbage designed the difference engine. He later gives up, moves on to the analytical, analytical engine instead. Okay, Augusta Adder suggests the use of a binary numbering system for storing information. So he was the grandfather, I guess, of our modern-day memory, which is all still based around binary numbers. George Bull discovers Boolean logic, which our digital logic is all based around. And in 1874, the first commercial typewriter is released. And in 1890, Holoris tabulator is invented. It's an early form of um, calculator. Okay, in 1906, the vacuum tube is invented by Lee De Forest. Um, in no 1910, teletype printers installed between New York and Boston. So a teletype printer was effectively, on one end you'd have a keyboard, on the other end you'd have like a printer. So anyone who typed something on the keyboard on one end would come out of the printer on the other end, and vice versa, they'd have a print keyboard on their end and a printer on the other end, so they could simply talk between each other by typing on the keyboard, it would come out the printer at the other end. Um, Dr. John V. Antanasoff and Clifford Berry developed the first electronic digital computer, in 1939. In 1940, remote computing demonstrated using the teletype printers between New Hampshire and New York. The teletype was not a computer, it was just the input-output device. So able to do remote computing by having a teletype printer at one location and a computer you know, many, many, many miles away. And by using the teletype printer, they could send some instructions to the computer and the computer would send its output back to the teletype, which would come out of the printer. In 1941, Conrad Zeus develops the Z3, which could solve complex engineering equations. Okay, so 18, 1947. So you can see that during the Second World War, there's a lot of m movement and push into computing because they needed the computing power to be able to crack those German um, communication codes. In 1947, the ENIVAC was developed. It consists of over 18,000 vacuum tubes. It weighed 30 tonnes and occupied a 30 by 50 feet square um, space. So you can understand that this, we're not talking about portable computing here, unless you're a, uh, a giant. Effectively, you'd have this computer in a room of its own and pretty much have its own power station to, to run it. In 1947, a transistor is developed in Bell Labs. In 1951, the first commercially designed and sold computer, the UNIVAC-1, was created. 
and Dr. Grace Hopper designs the UNIVAC-1 compiler. So in 1955, the first compiler for it was developed. So no longer did you actually have to write in machine code and punch out your binary cards. So you didn't have to write your cards in binary and then pump it into the computer and get a result. You can now start using a high-level, more abstracted language and use a compiler to simply de develop that binary code for you. So that was a great um, innovation. In 1955, Hiller and Isaacson composed the first piece of computer-generated music using the UNIVAC-1. So able to get the UNIVAC-1 to play a nice little tune. I don't know exactly what tune it was, but I'm sure it was something that was hip and number one on the charts in 1955. Okay, in 1957, the Fortran formula translator was developed. So Fortran was a very popular language. It still is popular in a lot of scientific communities. Um, it was developed, the first computer language to handle loops. So it was the first language that could actually handle iterative steps. Great innovation there. In 1958, Jack Kilby and Robert Noyce of Texas Instruments developed the first integrated circuit. So Texas, Texas Instruments is still around today. They're making uh, microcontrollers and DSP processors. In 1960, IBM's G series of the System 360 computers was the first to use integrated circuits. In 1962, Ivan Sutherland developed software for drawing and manipulating images in real time. So hence we have the first graphical user interface. In 1965, IBM develops the first electronic typewriter, referred to as the first word processor. In 1970, Intel introduces a 1K RAM chip. In 1971, Intel introduces the first microprocessor, the 4004 4-bit processor. In 1974, Motorola releases the 68 100 microprocessor, of which the processor that we use is, I guess it's great-great-great-grandchild, but it's still based around the same similar 6800 architecture. In 1978, the game Space Invaders is released, and that's probably the most important thing to remember, is when Space Invaders was released in 1978. Changed the way that we entertain ourselves today. In 2003, I guess, big jump, Motorola Splits renames its semiconductor division to Freescale and pretty much says Motorola will only make mobile phones, Freescale will take care of our semiconductors. And the reason I bring that comment up is because the processor we'll be using is a Freescale processor, formerly known as a Motorola processor. So one of the really important things to keep in mind is M Moore's Law. Moore's Law effectively defines that the number of transistors on a chip doubles every two years or increases by 32 times every decade. And you can see that he was, he was the um, head chief engineer at Intel, still, still is there as far as I know. Um, he developed this formula which pretty much stated that the number of transistors on a chip would double every, every two years. And you can see by the graph here that it's, he's pretty much spot on fit a bit of a bottleneck around the 2000 era because we can't increase the transistor density because we start getting heat issues, we start getting um, clock issues, we start getting issues related to the, the speed of the chip and the fact we can't dissipate the heat quick enough. So right now we've sort of tapered off a bit. But I'm sure they'll sort out those issues and we'll get back in, in line with Moore's Law. So uses of microcontrollers. Whether you know it or not, microcontrollers pretty much would be the most significant thing to impact on your life. When you get out of bed in the morning, you would come into contact with at least four or five microcontrollers before you even hit the front door and hop into your car. Microcontrollers are used extensively throughout the home. I've shown here, shown here an example of some appliances that maybe you're not very familiar with, but just for those who aren't very... Um, I guess, very useful around the home. We have the washing machine. It uses a microcontroller. Effectively, you simply push a few dials on the washing machine. The washing machine can detect the water levels, can, de can detect the weight of the washing in the washing machine, and it can choose an appropriate washing cycle to ensure that your clothes come out smelling nice and clean. 
Got the microwave also, which has a microcontroller in it. Simply punch in the time, the, the, um, the power level you want, and simply it'll cook your meal. So you can get some quite complex microwaves that will do sensing of, of the moisture level in the microwave and, and temperature of the, of the object that's cooking and be able to, like, I guess, fine-tune the, the power requirements of the microwave to not only make the microwave power efficient, but to also ensure that your meal comes out nice and cooked. So inside the home we have numerous microcontrollers and they're just two examples. We can move on to the more fun stuff and of course you know your surround sound packages have microcontrollers built into them so you've got a, a digital signal processing microcontroller that's capable of taking the Dolby encoded information and split it out to those five channels so you can hear that jet plane go whizzing across while you're watching your movie and you can hear those explosions coming from the right directions when you're you know in, engrossed in your you know fe feature film of course the dvd players you know they're riddled with with microprocessors you've got at least three or four microprocessors inside a dvd player you've got one really slow processor which is just there to interact with the user so when you push the keys and you have things come up on the screen it'll be a slow microprocessor to handle the slow interaction with the human because humans operate very slowly in comparison to you know the, the di digital digital domain and of course we have inside that DVD player we have some slightly more faster processors which are solely responsible for decoding the audio or decoding the video and then we've got one to ensure that the audio and video is synchronized in such a way that you can watch that video and not miss anything not have frames skip not have audio missing not have you know someone speaking and the audio appearing two or three seconds later so we've got lots of microprocessors to ensure that that viewing experience happens in the right way of course you've got your tvs you've got all the on-screen displays with your tvs you've got you know your um with your plasma tvs you've got microcontrollers ensuring the image rotates to ensure you don't burn out any of the pixels on your plasma and so forth so you don't get plasma burn and you know you've got microcontrollers to control the whole way that it works so microcontrollers really have sort of greatly impacted on our everyday life of course, when it comes to the way we work or study, I guess, microcontrollers have really impacted there as well. I guess it's thanks to microcontrollers that we now today have the internet, and the internet actually works at a reasonable rate thanks to microcontrollers because we have, we have microcontrollers inside our ADSL modems, we have them inside our cable modems doing the data encryption and compression to ensure that you know, all the data gets from point A to point B without any errors, without any um, at a very fast rate. So we have microcontrollers inside all our network connected devices, whether it's ADSL modems, cable modems, hubs, switches, you know, our printers, our, you know, other peripherals that we have are all filled up with these microcontrollers. They're pretty much everywhere. Lucky if you can actually point to an electronic device that doesn't have a microcontroller or, um, associated with it in some shape or form. So we've got the really obvious ones that microcontrollers are used in, such as laptops. Laptops, you know, we all know they have a pretty beefy processor in them, which is our Intel or AMD processor. But we also have microcontrollers inside those laptops as well. Those microcontrollers ensure that our LCD screen is at the right contrast, so we don't go, so we don't get blind if we're sitting in the dark using our laptop. Also, got controllers um, which maintain our battery charge to ensure that. You know, everything is powered down so it's nice and get the most out of our battery. And also when we're charging our batteries to ensure our battery doesn't overcharge and explode. We also have microcontrollers inside, you know, your PC to to do to take to do your monitoring of your processes to monitor your, you know, BIOS and to ensure that everything's happening smoothly. So we've got microcontrollers which sort of I guess play a support role to the major processes inside our hardware. And of course, we've got them inside our toys that we might use for work, inside our personal assistants, inside our mobile phones, inside you know all our communication devices. So a mobile phone effectively has a, micro, uh, a custom-built microprocessor inside it because you've got a very limited amount of space inside a mobile phone. We effectively have a custom-built custom processor which has the processing core required to do to drive the phone, as well as built-in memory 
to ensure that we have the amount of memory that we require to be able to run that phone properly. And we also have all the various input-output devices that we require that for that phone. So we have, um, I guess, analog-digital converters to do the speech-to-digital conversion as well as the digital-back-to-speech conversion. We have LCD controllers inside the, that, that microcontroller to ensure that we can drive that display efficiently and so forth. So inside mobile phones, we have very custom-specific built processors. And the, and the way that mobile phone um, companies overcome that huge cost of making those custom chips is they'll generally make one chip that's capable to be put in many, 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 many different phones, and then they'll simply activate or deactivate various capabilities of that chip simply by putting various pins of that chip high and low. So they generally try and you know, make one chip suitable for many, many models, but they are custom-built microcontrollers inside mobile phones. Inside PDAs, they're not so custom built because you can get a strong arm processor and stick it inside a palm or stick it inside a, a sharp Zorus, which is the silver one on the, on the left there. Of course, also when we play, we've got microcontrollers inside our iPods, inside our iRivers, inside our other MP, MP3 devices we have, inside our, you know, our iPod shuffles and so forth. We have microcontrollers in there that simply able to decompress that mp3 pump it out to our headphones so we can dance and boogie and get down on the move also got microcontrollers in in kids toys as well like furby down there in, in the bottom right furby's a great little toy he had a microcontroller inside him and he actually gave the impression of being a real live annoying furry creature so he actually interacted with people and they sort of gave him a slight impression that he was real. So he consisted of many microcontrollers to to run the various servos and actuators that he has to make him move around and look like a real life creature. So effectively the applications of microcontrollers they've pretty much found their way inside everything as I've said over the last few slides. You know, they're used extensively throughout computing, they've used extensively throughout our communications, making sure that our internet is working great and at a very high and reliable speed. High speed and, and very reliable. Also inside our various consumer electronics, our microwaves, our washing machines, our VCRs, our CD players, you know, our you know consoles that we plug into the TV and we play, you know, play with extensively inside our cable TVs, inside our you know, routers and hubs, and inside our cars. So if you've got a, a, a fairly modern day car, you'll find that if you pop the lid on the car, you'll only have a single wire running around inside the engine bay. And that's because that's effectively a single digi digital wire bus, which all the sensors on there are able to communicate via that one wire and talk to the microcontroller that ensures that your car is operating correctly, ensure the correct amount of petrol flow into the engine to ensure that you get the, you know, the economic, I guess, mile per, um, mile per litre that you really need to get out of your car. So microcontrollers can, I guess, ensure your car operates correctly as well as ensure that it's not going to cost you an arm and a leg to run it. So microcontrollers have found their way inside anything, basically everything and anything. And as the time progresses, you'll find that microcontrollers will find their way inside, you know, pretty much everything because people always want smarter things. They want a smarter fridge. They want a smarter oven. They want a smarter microwave. They want a smarter car. They want a smarter boat. They want a smarter, you know, house. They want a smarter this and that and the next thing. The only way that you can make something smarter is by putting a microcontroller in it. So where do I foresee that microcontrollers are heading? Well, effectively, microcontrollers will pretty much stay the same applications they're being used in now, except that we'll get greater memory capacity. So we'll be able to be able to step out into newer applications, so to speak, more on chip peripherals. So we'll be able to use it in more and more applications. Smaller footprint, so we can get it more portable and more, you know, fit in your pocket and make it more innovative, so you don't even know that it's actually there. And of course, lower power consumption is one of the major driving factors these days. The lower the power consumption you can make it, the better it's going to be. You can get a lot more life out of the battery, and you're not going to um, generate a huge carbon footprint. So make it a little bit more sustainable. And of course, they're going to become lead-free. 
the pretty much all of my controls these days are already lead free, but they'll pretty much make the entire product line lead free so we don't have as much impact on the environment when we start recycling these components. Okay, so when it comes to microcontrollers and what the future holds, there are effectively three different types of, of I guess, processing elements, so to speak. There are the microprocessors slash microcontrollers, which are cheap, flexible, multi-purpose and general. So these are the ones you can just go to Microtrip or Freescale or Texas Instruments, simply grab the component off the web and simply stick it on your PCB and start using it. So it's already a predefined solution for, I guess, for your application. You've then got the ability to go to ASIC, which is fully custom chips where you can actually start generating the metallization layers of a standard cell and start interconnecting that chip in a particular way to do the particular function that you want. So you don't rely so much on software to control the silicon. You're now interconnecting those silicon devices yourself so that you've got a hard-coded solution, so to speak. So, of course, it's a very custom design, and, of course, it's very expensive. We're talking, you know, very, very, very expensive. Billions of dollars. I mean, you've got to, if you want to create a, your own silicon foundry to make a silicon chip, you're looking at billions of dollars of investment. So very few people actually go down the path of making an ASIC. The alternative, which is a good compromise between microprocessors and ASIC, is, of course, field programmable gate arrays, or FPGAs. They're relatively cheap. They're able to take on a custom design so you can pretty much make a digital circuit and simply put it on an FPGA but of course you know, not, you know, there's no such thing as an ultimate solution with, um, with these things. There is a downside to using FPGAs and that is that they're relative, relatively slow but you can always overcome that hurdle by parallelizing up your function. So if you've got a lot of a lot of sequential steps that you want it to do. You simply put them in a pipeline or you cask do them in parallel, have multiple pipelines happening in parallel so that you can speed it up. So you can actually overcome the slowish thing, but of course it means you've got to start doing slightly more complex designs. Okay, so the weapon of choice, so to speak, for this course is in fact the ADAPT 9S12. This is the microcontroller that we will be using. It's effectively a Freescale processor. It is the Freescale MC9S12X DP512. So it is sitting in the middle of that board and this is a great little device. It's got so many options. It's so many, it's usable in so many different applications so that's why we've chosen it as the device that we'll be using in this course. So the ADAPT 9S12, so to have a look at it, in the figure here I show you the various components that we actually have on the PCB. And we actually have an RS-485 connector, we have you know, um, an RS-232 connector on it, so we have a 9-pin RS-232 connector, so that allows us to hook into the serial monitor that's running on the chip, that allows us to then program the, the code to then drive this microcontroller board. We've got some user LEDs, we've got some CAN transceivers, we've got a reset button, we've got some mounting holes so we can mount it on a nice little board and effectively that is what we've done. So we don't actually give you the raw device so to speak, we've gone and we've made it a little bit kitty safe. So what we've done is we've gone and actually stuck it inside a case like this with the Perspex lid on the top so you can actually see the device inside. So we've got a primary serial cable that's always connected to the to the box, and that is the primary serial cable that you use to program the device. We have two 50-pin header cables coming out of the box. Okay, and these two 50-pin header cables effectively allow us to connect to all the pins on the chip. So there's a 120-pin quad flat pack microcontroller in the middle of that board. We can connect to 100 of those pins. So some of the pins aren't actually available on the outside, but there are enough pins on the outside so we can do pretty much everything that we want to do inside this course. So there are two header cables then num named H1 and H2. H1 and H2 have different 
pins on the cables. Okay, so you can't just assume that because H1's got those pins that H2 will. Obviously, they're both 50 pin cables, and we've got 120 20 pins, so effectively, they're going to have different pins on each cable. There is a table, the H1 and H2 header cables. There is a table outlining exactly what those pin, what those cables have on them. So each one of those pins on those cables has a particular function. It is this table here that tells you what that particular function is. So you can always rip up these lecture notes in PDF format to see how to connect to this device, or you can either go to the laboratory resources and there's a PDF there about everything you need to know about the ADAPT 9S12. So you can look at that one as well. So this table is very important to, to actually look at when you're connecting the ADAPT 9S12 up to an external circuit. So these tables actually illustrate effectively what the pins connect to. So one thing you've got to realize about those connectors is that it's a 50 pin connector. On those cables there will be a red line on the cable. That red line defines where pin 1 is on the connector. So you go to the end of the cable with the red line and then you look at the black connector and the black connector will have an arrow on the side where pin 1 is. So it'll be a little black arrow etched on the side of the connector. So if you look at that arrow and on the end where the red is, that is pin 1. Then it simply goes pin 1 to pin 25 on that side and then directly opposite pin 25 is pin 26 and then it goes back down to pin 50. So pin 50 is in fact directly opposite from pin 1. So it's like a dual inline chip. It goes from 1 to 25, directly across to 26, back from 26 to 50, and then 50 is directly opposite pin 1. Very important to keep that in mind. Okay, so with the ADAPT 9S12 inside our little box, we have two um, DB9 connectors, they're male connectors on the end of the box. They are CAN buses, okay? We're not really using them this semester, but they're wired up for future experiments. We have on the top of the case a reset button, which has now been actually removed because due to some faults with it up until now, the reset button's kept getting stuck. So now we've removed that reset button and we've stuck it on the side near the load run switch. So there's now a reset button, push reset button on the side of the box. We have our auxiliary serial port. So we have a secondary serial port which is wired up, which we can then use to communicate to the outside world. So we've got to use a primary serial port to upload our code, but because the built-in debugger, built-in serial monitor has exclusive access to that primary serial port, we make use of the auxiliary one. So if we want to get any information back to the outside world, we use the auxiliary one. So there's a, a DB9 female connector near the primary serial port, which is, allows us to connect up to the computer so we can send information backwards and forwards. We also have on the side of that box a load run switch. So when you load the microcontroller, you simply click it to load position, reset the box, and then simply load your code up and when, when it's successfully loaded you can then flick the switch back to run, reset the box and your code will be running. It's as simple as that. So some of the key features with the MC9S12 XDP512 processor is the fact that it is effectively a dual processor system. Effectively we have a, a primary CPU, it's the CPU S12 which is the primary um, processor that we'll be using. But we also have a coprocessor, which is the X-Gate processor. So using the um, primary processor, we can simply have it do a particular task, and we can have the X-Gate processor, I guess, implementing some sort of complex communication protocol or doing a virtual device. Maybe if we've got a, we need a device that we don't actually physically have on our chip we might want to get the xgate to say bit bash it and emulate that particular device so we have this coprocessor that we can use to offload some of the work onto the copro so to speak so our processor our board is a or the mc9s is in fact a dual processor sort of mechanism with our with our um, microcontroller of choice so we have 8-bit GP general purpose I.O. port. So we have 
these various 8-bit parallel I.O. ports that we can use. So we can use them in any sort of particular way that we want. So we can pump out 8-bit digital values. We can read in 8-bit digital values. So we can communicate to the outside world in a digital fashion. So on, on our microcontroller, we have 12 8-bit parallel ports. And these are, of course, uh, port A, port B, port J, K, M, S, T, P, H, E. And we have port 80, 0, and port 81. Okay, all of these ports are accessible through the H1 and H2 headers. And of course, lots of these ports have shared shared purposes. So, for example, if you wanted to, say, use a serial port, well then, like one of the um, primary or, or secondary serial port, or you want to use one of the SBI ports, then of course you can't use port S. So a lot of these general purpose I ports have a dual or a shared purpose with a particular other I.O. subsystem. So you need to look at carefully which I.O. subsystem you're using and then not use the associated general purpose I.O. port. But more on this later when we talk about um, in introduction to input and output. We have various serial interfaces. So we've got parallel interfaces, GPIO, but we also have serial interfaces. We have six asynchronous serial ports. So these are RS-232 compatible. We have three serial peripheral interfaces, so we have three SBI ports, and we have one I2C interface as well. So we've got three different types of serial interfaces with numerous repetitions of those interfaces. So plenty of options. We have analog to digital conversion built into the chip as well, so we're able to actually... We have eight multiplexed input channels, we actually have two of these, so we actually have a 16, total of 16 multiplexed input channels. We have 10-bit successful approximation, so we can take any analog input value between 0 and 5 volts and turn it into a 10-bit binary number. More on this when we talk about analog digital conversions later in the analog subsystem. These IO, well, this, these subsystems are actually accessible through port 80.0 and port 81. We have programmable fixed duration sampling and we also have programmable repetition sampling as well. So we've got various configurational options when it comes to talking to or, or I guess reading analog signals. We have a timer subsystem. We have numerous timer subsystems inside, inside this chip as well. We have a timer overflow subsystem so we can use this to do to generate periodic interrupts. So we can get an interrupt running every millisecond up to every second. We've got a watchdog timer so we can have a little protection circuit that if our code starts doing something it shouldn't be, we can have a watchdog jump in and generate an interrupt and then of course recover our program before it does anything disastrous. We've got input output capture compare capabilities so we can generate square waves, we can read in square waves, we can um, I guess do period um, decoding of digital waves so we can actually have a periodic wave square wave come in and we can actually decode the period of those square waves we've got pulse width modulators so we can generate square waves they're very useful for generate for um, controlling DC motors but more on that later and we have real-time interrupt mechanisms we have a phase lock loop so we can actually speed up our base clock our base clock is in fact 8 megahertz but we can speed that all the way up to 40 megahertz if we want to using the phase lock loop so we can do um, direct clock control. So if we've got situations where we might, I guess, be running on a mains power, we can speed that clock up to 40 megahertz. If, in fact, it's unplugged and we start running on battery, we can slow that clock down to 8 megahertz. And it depends purely on what sort of application you're doing to how fast or how slow you make that clock run. Also have fine, f sorry, we also have five CAN interface ports. Only two of them are actually wired and these support transfer rates up to 1 megabit per second, and it supports CAN 2.0 um, versions A and B, or A and B modes. Okay, when it comes to storage capabilities of this chip, we effectively have on uh, numerous different technologies on chip. We have 32K of SRAM, okay, it's paged, so we actually have 4K of that that is always accessible, and we have another 4K window, so we can actually chop and change which 4K of that um, 
32K that we see at a particular time. So we use these paging registers to keep track of which 4K page we're dealing with at one point, uh, particular point in time. We have 4K of EEPROM. We can see 1K of that EEPROM at one point in time. Okay, but then we can chop and change. We then have another 1K EEPROM window that we can then chop and change to be any of those other three 1K sections of that memory map. We have 512K of flash. It's also paged. So we actually have 16K, 16K of unpaged flash. Then we have a 16K um, flash, which is the window onto that 512k of flash that we have and then we have another 16k of unpaged flash so effectively we have 32k of flash that we can see at one point in time but then we have a 16k window that we can set it to a particular 16k page of that 512k of flash so because we only have a 16-bit address bus in this microcontroller we can effectively only see from 0 to F, 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 F. So we can only see 65,536 different memory locations with our 16-bit address bus. But we can effectively see the whole 24-bit address space simply by changing those paging page registers to look at a different EEPROM section or look at a different SRAM section or look at a different flash section. But more on that later when we look at memory. Okay, so I hope that's really sort of driven at home about the importance of microcontrollers and how they really changed our life and how they came about to to become a reality and effectively also um, where they seem to be heading down the track a bit later on and also hope that you've got a really good idea about the device that we'll be using in labs this semester so should you require any further assistance on this lecturing topic please don't hesitate to ask your demonstrator post a question on the forum email me the convener or make an appointment to see me or grab me after a lecture or grab me after the tute, whatever. But please just ensure that all your questions get answered.